Imagine for a moment being able to accurately predict where and how wild animals will be moving across a given landscape without spending years in the field tracking them down. This is the promise and the allure of habitat connectivity modeling, and that's going to be the subject of my presentation this afternoon, whatever time it is when you're watching this video. I'm Ron Sutherland, Chief Scientist for Wildlands Network, and supported here by Alex Vanko, our GIS specialist, who ran the new models I'll be showing you in a minute. I've been involved with connectivity modeling basically my entire career so far. Most notably, we've put together a fine-scale multi-species connectivity modeling effort for the South Atlantic Landscape Conservation Cooperative, 90 meter resolution, resolution models for seven species from Florida to Virginia, with Paul Leonard at Clemson figuring out how to run CircuitScape on the massive Clemson University supercomputer. We also ran 270 meter resolution models of three species for the Southeast Climate Science Center across the entire Southeast with Nick Haddad and other collaborators from NC State and USGS. A bit about Wildlands Network, we're a nonprofit dedicated to reconnecting, restoring, and rewilding nature across North America. We were basically the original group thinking about continental scale connectivity since the early 1990s when it was decidedly uncool to be that radical. Now, of course, conservation science and political will have caught up to the reality that facilitating wildlife movement is critical. Should take a quick second to acknowledge our funders for this work, the South Atlantic. Landscape Conservation Cooperative, Southeast Climate Science Center, Kraft Foundation, Volgeno Foundation, and numerous private donors. And I should say that's just for our work in the East. Now, why connectivity modeling? Conservationists are now placing great emphasis on designing and implementing networks of habitat. Why do we need a network of habitat? Well, species need to move in order to survive for a number of reasons. They need to migrate seasonally. They need to achieve genetic interchange to avoid inbreeding. They need to form larger populations to, that are less prone to extinction. And they need to migrate in response to climate change. What is habitat connectivity? Well, it can be defined simply as the degree to which species are able to move across the landscape. So creatures need to move, but where and how and when, these are important questions for wildlife management and for conservation. One obvious solution is to get out in the field and start monitoring where wildlife are already moving. This empirical approach is best exemplified by the USGS wildlife migration studies in the Western US. Take uh, you know, a look at this, this great report that's come out, and I think they're on the, to volume two soon here. Uh, you know, they've tracked hundreds of GPS tracked of ungulates out in the West, leading to detailed maps of annual migration routes. In most ecosystems though, and for most species, we lack detailed tracking data of annual movements. And even for ungulates and other high dollar wildlife, it's very hard to track wildlife moving in response to climate change. There are also a number of situations where it would be nice to be able to understand how rare species might spread across areas where they no longer occur, how they will recover. For example, Florida panthers in the southeastern US that are currently stuck in South Florida but might want to expand. For these reasons, and in concert with the development of GIS techniques and GIS land cover and roads data in the early late 1990s, early 2000s, Conservation scientists have increasingly relied on com computer-based connectivity models to predict the critical movement needs and opportunities for a variety of wildlife. So what are these connectivity, connectivity models and how do they work? Well, there are now dozens of, of these of connectivity models, more than I have time to review in this presentation. I'll send you to uh, this link at conservationcorridor.org, uh, great folks there who have compiled a great list of, of pr connectivity programs and tools. And the models that are out there differ in their data requirements and also in their degree of realism and sophistication. The models also display a wide range in terms of their ease of interpretation of the results. There are some generalities that can be made. Most of the models start with the assumption that movement has some cost associated with it and that organisms are efficiency minded and would like to minimize that cost in their movements. The friction that prevents effortless movement across the landscape is termed landscape resistance. And most of the models begin with deriving a GIS layer of resistance values across the study area. There's many options for how you can create that resistance layer. Uh, you can use empirical studies, probably the gold standard. You can also use expert opinion to rank land cover types and assess different types of barriers. Or you can just use simple rules of thumb. There's also climate change and landscape change. You might need to multiple time steps or resistance, resistance layers to keep track of the changes you, you wanna to consider to make predictions about future levels of habitat connectivity or future movements. Many of the models also require you to identify the origins and destinations of the moving or dispersing organisms, the core areas or hubs or nodes as they're called. 
In its simplest form, this is just the set of occupied habitat patches under current conditions. But again, sometimes you want to model for species that are recolonizing emptier but empty but suitable habitat types. Or sometimes you just don't have enough information about a given species or ecosystem to really define the nodes. Then there's climate change. Even if you know where a species is distributed now, you may have to make separate decisions or guesses about where the species would like to be in the future. Other models, though, skip the, the node and core step, which can be very relieving when you're dealing with rare or understudied species where we just don't know enough about their current distribution to map out the nodes. And lastly, it's worth pointing out that many of the connectivity modeling approaches can either be run for a specific set of species, deriving nodes and resistance layers for each one, or they can be applied to non-species specific general model of connectivity from the ecosystem perspective. So now I'm gonna run through a quick review of some of the more common connectivity modeling tools and approaches, just to give you an idea of what the inputs and outputs look like. So hopefully you can start making up your own mind about the tools you might like to use. Let's start with a small slice of heaven, in this case, a study area in the Sand Hills region of North and South Carolina, where I did much of the field work for my PhD. Zooming in, here's the aerial imagery for the region. You can see it has a, a, a nice mix of, of large blocks of longleaf shown here, rural agricultural matrix, and then some urban areas uh, shown here. They'll show up better in the resistance layer in a second. There's so lots of rare species here and lots and some very interesting connectivity challenges to consider. So here's the, the landscape resistance model we created for timber rattlesnakes for our South Atlantic LCC study. Timber rattlesnakes are great flagship species for connectivity just because they're so abysmally bad at crossing highways. And here's the set of polygon nodes or core areas we created for the rattlesnakes, which were then simplified to single node points, these yellow dots, to make the computations easier for a few of the different models. So let's start with the simplest approach, these cost paths where you calculate the single line that represents the lowest accumulated resistance path between each relevant pair of nodes. This is easy to do with the program linkage mapper. It's very quick and simple. And the, the trade-off is that almost no one believes that real animals are capable of finding and using a solitary line of pixels across the landscape. Next, you can add a bit of more realism and dimensionality by modeling least cost corridors between each pair of nodes. These show not just one path, but say the top 5% of paths. And you can set that threshold. This gives the potential corridors some width to consider and shows multiple routes in some areas. It's also done easily with the linkage mapper tool. And I think this is a good sweet spot in terms of realism, the trade-offs between realism and simplicity of interpretation of the results. We can take that realism a significant step further into the, the circuit theory-based approaches, starting with the big one, CircuitScape, which is developed by Brad McRae. Back in the day, CircuitScape makes the prediction that organisms will move across different pathways in the landscape in proportion to the resistance offered by each route, which is what electrons apparently do. So using the same node and corridor layer, you can model the flow of timber rattlesnakes from all the patches to one central patch or pairwise between each pair of nodes. This yields a very complex and interesting map of connectivity. We hope quite realistic in the way animals might actually move across the landscape but the realism incurs the cost of making it harder to interpret the results. It could take my entire presentation here to interpret this one map, but I'll point out you know, the, the core challenge of CircuitScape, which is that in broadly suitable areas, the predicted flow spreads out, which leads to lower current density per pixel. In pinch points, often surrounded by the worst habitats and barriers, the current flow can be very concentrated, but which represents the higher connectivity value? And which do you focus your conservation dollars on? good questions. Omniscape and its relative, the wall-to-wall -wall circuitscape approach, are a more recent derivative of circuitscape, and they're used where you're not able or willing to define nodes. You just break the landscape up into small pieces and run circuitscape on the underlying resistance layer for each piece. It's done pixel uh, by pixel for omniscape, and, uh, and then it's done wall-to-wall -wall for the wall-to-wall -wall approach, or edge-to-edge, -edge, I should say, and then you stack up the results. The advantage is you don't need those nodes to run the models. The intuitive disadvantage that matches our experience so far is that these approaches give you a very localized view of connectivity that may not help you define or predict longer migration routes or sort of concrete wildlife corridors. You can see the fine grain of the connections in this output. Next, we've got the, the connectivity analysis toolkit developed by connectivity guru, Carlos Carroll. There are several modeling approaches built into CAT 
which like Omniscape don't require you to define nodes. One is called the shortest path between the centrality. It uses algorithms to simulate what would happen if you were to draw a least cost path between every pair of pixels across the study area. In some low resistance places, these pathways would start to stack up. And those are the places with higher centrality scores, shown here in red. CAT uses hexagons as inputs, and one disadvantage seems to be just the visual style of the outputs. The high centrality corridors are very angular, and some people just don't seem to like that. You can also run what's called current flow between a centrality in CAT, which simulates circuit flow between each pair of hexagons, kind of in, in the same way as shortest path between a centrality. The output is, is perhaps easier to understand. It can be closer to some of the node-based circuit approaches. But it's also computationally fairly intensive. It's hard to do for a large study area. There are some other model types out there, including ones uh, that simulate the movements of individual organisms. I have less experience with those so far, uh, but I imagine that one core strength of an individual-based model is the ability to more easily factor in the accumulating mortality risk faced by a species. If you parameterize that right, it could start to show you how far is too far. You know, if you send a million little movement bots out into your simulated landscape, and if none of them make it to the destination, it's a good clue that the barriers might be too intense in that direction. So that is a quick recap of some of the more common connectivity modeling approaches. Now let's talk about future research needs. I don't think I'm gonna go out on a limb here to say that the biggest need for research need for connectivity modeling is to try to ground the results in empirical reality. How well do these different types of models work at predicting the actual movements or gene flow of a given species? How does the choice of landscape resistance metrics and source data influence the predictive ability of the models? One of the other refinements of connectivity modeling that is urgently needed is to better understand what conditions lead to the absence of connectivity, the failure to connect points A and B. Many of the models, like least cost paths, will show you a connection even if there are 20 interstates and a uranium mine in the way between those two points. And that is a failing that needs to be fixed soon. We also need to know more about what types of non-optimal habitat species will cross and won't cross. For example, the southern hognose snake is a xeric adapted species that likes upland longleaf pine forest. These forests are often broken naturally into pieces by river corridors full of very different vegetation, like swamp forest. We can model a migration route for little hognose snakes between longleaf patch A and B, but will they actually cross the swamp to get there? We don't know. Empirical data can try to help with these questions, but it's undeniably harder to connect data on movements of randomly dispersing small animals versus mapping out the sort of known migration pathways used by large animals year after year. So lastly, I promised I would say a few words about the development of our Eastern Wildway map. We wanted to put together a vision map showing what a robust habitat network covering the entire East Coast of North America could look like. And while this network has been talking about continental scale corridors for decades, but all we had was this big swoop map to show people. So I set out in 2016 to see if we couldn't make a much more spatially refined vision of what the Eastern Wildlife could look like. It was meant to be optimistic, to show what could be achieved if we all work together to protect and restore habitat, to rebuild wildlife corridors, to install wildlife road crossings, and to make our human communities more permeable and favorable to the movement needs of animals. To make the map, we stacked up a number of different large scale data sets that were already out there, synthesizing them with a hybrid approach that I'm terming human intelligence. We took the existing data, including our own data. And then we, we used our, our own brains to draw in where the corridors should go on top of those data sets. It was altogether a very satisfying and enlightening process. It certainly caused us to pay attention to each part of the East Coast as we went. And it yielded this beautiful map shown here. This is version 2.2, the latest one of the, of the entire Eastern Wildway. We even had an artist, Mike Reagan, render a watercolor painting of the Eastern Wildway shown here. And we distributed over a thousand copies of the Wildway poster. Let me know if you want a copy. There's more work to do to share this Wildway vision with folks and to develop similar vision maps across the rest of the continent. And I certainly hope that in the rush to continue offloading all of our research decisions, all of our science onto artificial intelligence, that we retain the ability to use our own human intelligence to make sense of the world. Try it, you'll like it. To conclude, I hope this was a helpful introduction to the art and science of connectivity modeling. As someone who enjoys field work as much as anyone, I'm definitely of the opinion that connectivity models need to be paired with and informed by long-term empirical studies of actual animals. But models can certainly serve a useful purpose for making predictions about animal movement under uncertainties posed by the lack of data, or in the case of future changes, the basic impossibility of having good empirical data to know exactly what is gonna happen next in the natural world.
Thanks very much for listening and please reach out with any questions.